Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are continuing in the book of Exodus. We'll be in Exodus chapter 13 tonight, so I want to encourage you to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 13. We'll be there in just a moment. If you have any questions or concerns about class tonight, if there's something that we need to be praying about, if there's some way that we can help you as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send a message to me by using the email address info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send me a text or give a call to 608-224-0274. Uh, thank you so much for your patient endurance as I've been traveling for the past several weeks. For those of you who may only join us for these Wednesday classes, I'll just give the update that the last three Wednesdays in September, I was traveling out west. The first week I spent camping in Colorado and attending a series of lectures on the book of Psalms at the Bear Valley Bible Institute over in Denver, Colorado. And then from there, I spent a little bit of time traveling through Utah and Nevada and Arizona and California and Oregon and eventually made it to see my sister out in Washington State. I was with her for a few days and worshiped with the church out there in Port Angeles, Washington before heading back east and doing some hiking along the way, including a very brief trip through Glacier National Park and eventually making my way back home. And I thought my adventures might have been done. I was looking forward to being with you last Wednesday evening, but as I was away, our daughter found a house in Tennessee, and so I scheduled an incredibly quick trip to Tennessee after worship a week and a half ago, driving a moving van down there after worship with all of her stuff in it, unloading it on Monday, getting the stuff settled in on Tuesday, getting things worked out down there, and then flying back to Madison last Wednesday. So I am finally back. I'm very thankful that you've put up with my weird schedule sometimes, and I'm uh, also thankful that we've had some very interesting videos over the past several weeks looking at some of the Bible lands. If you missed any of those, I would highly recommend just looking up Bible land passages through World Video Bible School and taking some time to do some exploring there. I believe at least one of the people involved in making those videos might have been caught up in the situation in Israel a few days ago. I don't know if their trip was canceled or whether they are stuck over there trying to make their way back home. I did hear something about that. I didn't hear the details, but I'm very thankful for those who uh, continue really to put themselves at risk to go over there and learn and study and they're able to put together some very uh, very well thought out videos very professionally done and I'm very thankful for those uh, videos that we can share in our Wednesday evening class when I'm out of town well we are back to the book of Exodus so we are in Exodus chapter 13 tonight uh, bringing us up to speed at least a little bit the last time we were together in this class about a month ago you may remember that we studied the tenth and the final plague of the ten plagues, the death of the firstborn, and that was in Exodus chapter 12. Well, of course, if you remember from what we studied, or if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, you may know that the Israelites could avoid the death of their firstborn by spreading the blood of a lamb on the doorpost of their home. And if they did that, the angel of the Lord would pass over their homes. And that, of course, is the origin of the Passover, which was an annual celebration. And it would be so significant, in fact, that it would become the first day of the year for these people. So as a nation, their calendar would be starting over. God was resetting their calendars. Well, at midnight, the firstborn of Egypt die. Pharaoh basically uh, invites them to leave quite forcefully. He basically drives the Israelites out of Egypt. After all the hassle that he gave in not letting them leave, now he is forcing them out. He's an angry man. And they are ready to go, of course, because they have just prepared unleavened bread, just as God had instructed. And you may remember they also looted the Egyptians by simply asking their neighbors for all their valuable stuff. And the neighbors felt sorry for him and forked it over, just giving them gold, silver, all kinds of precious metals, and sending them on their way. So let's jump back into it tonight. That's our brief review. So we're at uh, Exodus chapter 13 tonight. And let's just start out with the first two verses. We'll kind of ease back into it here. Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, it belongs to me. Well, here at the beginning, God establishes a principle that I think we've seen alluded to earlier, but now it comes in the form of a command. 
And that is, the people are to sanctify. That is, they are to set apart every firstborn to the Lord. And I think we've already seen the importance of the firstborn. We had the whole incident with the birthright between uh, Jacob and Esau. We've had some other references to birth order being somewhat important along the way back then. But I want us to notice here that God specifically wants the firstborn to be set apart for him. So this is to be done to honor God. And we'll get back to this a little bit later tonight. But here at the beginning, God establishes the truth that the firstborn belongs to him under the old covenant. And obviously all children belong to God in some sense. But think about the firstborn for just a moment. Why are the firstborn especially important right at this moment in history? Well, if you remember, God had just saved the firstborn from death by having them spread the blood of the lamb around the doors of their homes. And so, in a sense, God had saved the firstborn in a way that others hadn't been saved. If you were the second or the third or the fourthborn, your life wasn't at risk that night. But if you were the firstborn, your life was at risk. And, of course, God skipped over or passed over those homes where the blood had been spared. And so, in a sense, as I said, God had saved the firstborn in a way that the others had not necessarily been saved. And so, going forward then, the firstborn, in a sense, literally owed their lives to the Lord in a way that the others really did not. And so, going forward, therefore, the firstborn had a pretty special relationship with God. They belong to God. God owns them in a special way because of him saving them on that night. All right, well, let's continue on with a little bit more information here. Exodus 13, and let's go ahead and look at verses 3 through 5. Exodus chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery. For by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. On this day in the month of Abib you are, to, you are about to go forth. It shall be when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give to you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe this right in this month. So notice here as they are on their way out of Egypt, perhaps as they camp on that very first night, Moses explains some of the rationale behind celebrating the Passover on an ongoing basis. That seems to be the emphasis here. This is why we will do what we will continue to do. The Passover is designed to help the people remember. So they are to remember that day when God led them out of the land of Egypt. And so from this time on, God will often introduce himself to people by saying something like this. I am the Lord your God who led you out of the land of Egypt. Does that sound somewhat familiar? I think we see that over and over throughout the Old Testament as he introduces himself to some new character, basically giving them the very brief review in that little statement. Well, this is where it starts. And I also want us to notice in this passage the emphasis on slavery. You were slaves, but now you are free, all because of the powerful hand of the Lord. So this isn't something they accomplished. It's not that they fought their way out of slavery, nothing like that. But this is something that the Lord had to do for them. He did for them what they were unable to do for themselves. Obviously, yes, they got up and walked out. They prepared the unleavened bread and so on, just as they had been commanded. But the Lord is the one who has accomplished this. Well, in verse 5, we have some insight concerning what's next. God is about to bring them into a land that is currently occupied by a whole lot of other people. Some other nations are already living there. And when he does this, God will be fulfilling the oath or the promise that he originally made to Abraham. He describes this land of promise as a land flowing with milk and honey. We've seen that statement a few times in scripture already, looking forward to that place. But the point here is that once you're in this new land, you will continue to observe this right in this month. So the, the Passover, the big idea here is will be an ongoing practice. This is not a one-time event. This is something that you will celebrate on a yearly basis to remember the day and to think back to the day when God led them out of the land of Egypt and out of their slavery. Well, let's continue with some of the details of this Passover celebration described for us in Exodus 13, verses 6 through 10. Exodus chapter 13, verses 6 through 10. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. 
Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leaven shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. You shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand, and as a reminder on your forehead, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Well, the Passover celebration then was not just one day. We've established that. This is the reminder. But they had to prepare for it, notice in this passage, for at least a week beforehand. So they had to clear out all the leaven from their homes. And then for seven days they were to eat unleavened bread. And this was a nationwide ordinance. No leaven was to be found anywhere within their borders. They were to go searching for it and get rid of it. And notice in verse 8 how this was designed to teach. I think we noted this a month or so ago when we had the first reference to it, but the Passover was designed to make children ask questions. And I love that. God is thinking of the children here. This is not primarily for the grown-ups. This is for the kids in the nation. And I think we understand, most of us know, that people learn best when multiple senses are involved, don't they? And so instead of just hearing a lecture, the Passover was something that they could touch and they could taste and they could smell and they could also see it. And so all of the senses are involved and, and they would do this and the kids would naturally ask, why? Kids are so good at doing that, aren't they? Why are we doing this? Why are you searching out all the leaven? Why are you burning the leaven? You know, why are we eating this weird thing only once a year? Why are we doing this? And I think we face the same questions today with the Lord's Supper, don't we? And I know we've discussed this before, but when we take the bread and when we take the fruit of the vine, and if we have a toddler anywhere near us at that moment, they're going to ask about that, won't they? I know I've been asked about that over and over in my lifetime. I've done the asking of that question when I was little, I'm sure. And the kids want to know, what is that? Why are you doing that? What is that that you're drinking? Can I have some? And over and over, kids are full of questions. Well, so also with the Passover. It was designed to teach. And notice then in verse 9, we have a brief reference to something that we will learn more about in just a moment. But for now, we have this brief note about some kind of sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead or between your eyes, I think some translations say, so that God's law would be in your mouth. Well, it's kind of hard to know how to take this. Some have taken this to be a reference to the eating of the Passover. So it's before your eyes, it's in your hand, it's in your mouth. The senses, as I just described. However, it's explained a little bit further on. He'll get back to this in just a moment. Uh, but it seems there could be some reference to the phylacteries, or at least that's the way they took it. That's the way they applied it. Uh, maybe you're familiar with those small boxes uh, containing little pieces of scripture. Those boxes would be tied to their arms and to their foreheads. And, of course, that became a problem over time, didn't it, of course, as God's people kind of twisted it and they started uh, using those phylacteries to brag. My phylactery is bigger than your phylactery. This big box on my head has more scripture on it. Therefore, I must be closer to God than you are. Well, a ridiculous thing to do. God isn't impressed by that. Uh, but for now, we just have, I think, kind of the concept introduced, or at least this is the way they apply it later on. There, there seems to be some kind of sign uh, on their hands, on their foreheads, causing them to remember God's law. And we'll get back to that uh, briefly. Uh, but we close verse 10 with a reminder that this is to continue year after year at the appointed time. So again, not a one-time event. This is to be an annual celebration. Well, let's continue on with Exodus 13, verses 11 through 13. Exodus 13, 11 through 13. Now, when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with the lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So now we get back to the firstborn. We have that reference up at the beginning of the chapter. Seems a little bit chopped up here. Uh, but now we're introduced to the concept of redeeming the firstborn. 
So basically, as I understand this, the firstborn belong to God. And so the idea is parents are to devote their firstborn to the Lord, both people and animals. So the firstborn males belong to the Lord. They are his. However, the people must then redeem the firstborn. And today, I think most of us still know what it means to redeem a coupon or to redeem a gift card of some kind. You know what it means to redeem the Scoopy tokens at Culver's, don't we? We understand this here in Wisconsin. You get 10 of those little Scoopy tokens and you can trade them in for another kid's meal. Kind of a cool thing. Or maybe you could take the uh, free Scoop token back to the counter and redeem that for a cone or a dish, the flavor of the day or whatever. And so the idea of redeeming is, is that we trade something in. We make an exchange. Well, so also the firstborn belong to God. But the people were required to redeem them, that is, as I understand it, in a sense, to buy them back from the Lord. Well, in the case of a donkey, the donkey was an unclean animal, so they couldn't dedicate that to the Lord. Uh, they had to redeem it with a lamb. They had to make a swap. So here, God, you take this, and I'll keep my donkey. That seems to be the concept here. But if they refused and said, nope, I'm not going to give you a lamb in exchange for this firstborn donkey, well, God said, you've got to kill the donkey. Uh, in the case of people, they also had to redeem the firstborn. And we don't have a lot of detail here. We'll get to that later, but we've got the concept. And they dare not ignore this. The firstborn belong to the Lord. They are his. But we also find that they are to be redeemed. They are to be bought back from God. The idea of trading something for something else. Okay, let's continue with Exodus 13, verses 14 through 16. Exodus 13, 14 through 16. And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries on your forehead, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. In verse 14, we get back to all of this being a teachable moment. That whole setup was designed to provoke questions from the children. So your sons will ask, what is this? And the people are to explain that all of this goes back to God leading them out of slavery in Egypt. And it's all tied to the tenth and final plague, the death of the firstborn. So God killed every firstborn, but he redeemed those who were covered by the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. Therefore, going forward, Israel must continue sacrificing the firstborn in recognition of that event many years previously. And again, we don't have every detail here. God will fill some of that in as we go along. But God here is establishing the basic principle that the firstborn under that covenant are to be dedicated to the Lord because the firstborn have been redeemed. Well, then in verse 16, we come to the first mention of phylacteries in Scripture, the first time that term comes across. And again, we had what seemed to be an allusion to this earlier in the chapter, the idea of some kind of memory tool on their hands, on their foreheads. Uh, but here we have the actual word. And I believe the word refers to bands. B-A-N-D-S, bands or straps, frontlet bands. And if you've seen these in use today, then you know that these little boxes, they're literally, they are strapped on. And I remember a story making the news not long after 9-11, I think, I don't know, within the first year after 9-11, where, where two men were at the gate at an airport. But before they got on the plane, they knelt down and they took these leather straps several feet long and they started wrapping them around their arms. That is something that most people haven't seen, especially when you're getting ready to board an airplane. That's a weird, that's kind of a weird practice for most of us. We don't see people wrapping leather straps around their arms and around their heads uh, before getting on a plane. And it turns out, though, that the two men were Orthodox Jews who were simply putting on their phylacteries. And there was an unusual process to it. There's a lot of tradition to it. So, uh, they pray as they do that. There are set prayers that need to be said. And, and it would sound like mumbling, I think, to most of us, especially if it's done in Hebrew and we don't speak Hebrew. So they're kind of mumbling under their breath and they're wrapping themselves with these long leather straps in a very methodical manner. 
And when I saw the picture, it, it literally looked like black electrical tape, like about an inch wide leather straps. I mean, what would you do if you were about to get on an airplane and some guy starts wrapping black electrical tape around his arms? You know, that's a problem. And it, it was a problem until the authorities checked it out and realized what it was. So I'm just saying there are still people who uh, use the phylacteries today. And th this is where it starts. It all goes back here to Exodus chapter 13. Well, let's continue with Exodus 13, verses 17 through 19, the next paragraph. Exodus 13, 17 through 19. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence God led the people around the way of the around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. What an interesting little paragraph. The mission was to get the people from Egypt to the Promised Land. And that was maybe a couple hundred miles. I mean, it was a trip that should have taken a couple weeks at most with even a large group of people. However, I want us to note here, God does not lead them along the most direct and the shortest route, but instead God is concerned that they might be discouraged by seeing the Philistines. And so he takes them on a detour uh, around by the Red Sea. I know we've had a few scattered references to the Philistines up to this point in Scripture, but here we learn they are a people of war. It seems like the Philistines are always fighting. And uh, it seems like people are still always fighting in that area, in Gaza, that little land traditionally between Egypt and Israel. And God figures people are not quite ready for that at this point. I mean, he's doing good just to get them out of Egypt now. And so he takes them around by the scenic route, as I would describe it, so they don't get overwhelmed and decide to go back to Egypt. By the way, there have been a lot of excavations done along that route that they skipped, and they have found a lot of forts along that route. I mean, huge fortifications, because this is between Egypt and the rest of the world, and if they're going to get attacked, it's going to come down right there by the kind of southeastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and they were ready for it. So I want us to think about the Israelites fleeing Egypt. They're going to have to go by fort after fort after Egyptian fort, one after the other. And that that would be unnerving, to say the least. And so God basically says, uh, let's not do that. Uh, we're going to go out here in the middle of nowhere. We're going to get away from the people of Egypt. And we're going to make our own path out here in the wilderness. And then notice in verse 19, we have what has to be one of my favorite verses anywhere in Exodus. As we learn that on the way out the door, Moses takes the bones of Joseph with him. And the reason is, Joseph could see this day coming. Joseph knew that God would come and take his people out of Egypt. And Joseph wanted his bones taken with them when that day finally came. And I know we discussed this at the end of Genesis when he first made this request. Um, you know, how this was a great statement of faith for him, for Joseph to ask for this. I mean, this is very future looking. Um, but now it's happened, and Joseph did not want to be buried in a pyramid like all the other great leaders, but he wanted his bones to be portable. Put me in a suitcase, so to speak, and uh, because I want you to grab me on your way out, because God will take care of you. He will be with you. He will not forget you, and he will bring you to the promised land, and now that time has come, and as the people are leaving, they grab the bones of Joseph on their way out. I'm just imagining Moses, you know, as the leader of two to three million people delegating that, you know, you and you get the bones of Joseph and kind of tag, you're it, you need to kind of stick with this over the next whatever it takes, and, uh, and they get it done. Well, let's conclude tonight with Exodus 13, verses 20 through 22. Exodus 13, 20 through 22. Then they set out from Succoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. In verse 20, they camp on the edge of the wilderness, and this is where we uh, first learn that God led them by um, going before them in this pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night to give them light. 
And uh, kind of an interesting, maybe a thought question, why would God make provisions for traveling by night? And I think if we look ahead at where they're headed out into those desert areas, there could be a huge advantage to maybe resting during the daytime sometimes and doing a bulk of their travel at night when the temperatures were cooler. Also did some reading earlier today about uh, big groups of people traveling, armies traveling from one place to another. They would often uh, put some kind of a fire up on top of a big pillar. And so if the people wanted to know where their leaders were or which direction they were going, there would be this sign. And they could see the smoke of that during the day. They could see the glow of it by night. So maybe a similar thing going on here. Um, in my mind, before looking at this paragraph again this week, I, I kind of thought God sent them or gave them this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. But what I've found interesting, the text actually says that the Lord was going before them in the pillar of cloud and in the pillar of fire. Isn't that interesting? God's presence was actually in the pillar of cloud and fire in some sense. And that pillar was always there. And we'll get back to this as we continue on in our study of Exodus over the next several weeks. But for now, we have studied Exodus chapter 13. Again, if you have any questions, any concerns, any comments about tonight's class, if there's any way that we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you as a congregation, if there's something we need to be praying about, uh, we invite you to get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or make a call at 608-224-0274. We would really love to hear from you. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God who redeems your people. You have bought us back, and you are a God who leads your people. We know, we understand with our minds that you always want what's best for us. You know that freedom is better than slavery, even though we don't always understand this today. Sometimes this world gets us all confused, even to the point where we don't even realize that we are enslaved to sin as we are. And Father, we need the freedom that you provide. We pray that you would help us to always know that you are the deliverer of your people. We've certainly seen that tonight, and we know that you will also deliver us from the slavery of sin through the blood of your Son, the Passover Lamb. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross. We come to you in his name tonight. Amen.